Welcome to season four of the Coffee and Geography podcast. The aim of the show is to get to know, explore, and celebrate the diverse and intersectional range of people and their love for the world. Join your host, Kit Marie Rackley, and have fun exploring all the myriad of ways guests can connect their lives to geography. Today, let's listen to Artificial Intelligence, the fears and opportunities of AI, how it is impacting education, the ways it can support geography teachers, and other things. Got your brew ready? Great! Enjoy the listen. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a new season of Coffee and Geography. We're back! So it's like it's been a while, hasn't it? Well, we have a special quirky episode to kick us off this year, and that is with a mystery guest. Now, don't worry, all will be revealed, but let's get straight on with it and welcome Athena. Hi, Athena. How are you doing today? Hi, hello, and what a delight to be here. I'm doing splendidly. Thanks for asking. I'm stoked to dive into some fascinating geography talk with you all. Now, in the name of honesty, just to let folks know that Athena is using a digital voice synthesizer to be able to speak to us, which I think is a first for this podcast. But yeah, it's uh, really interesting, this technology. And when it comes to this tech, I guess the first person who comes to mind is uh, Professor Stephen Hawking. You got it. Hawking was a pioneer in the use of speech synthesis technology to help him communicate after he lost the use of his voice. He used a special computer system called Equalizer, which used predictive text and sound-generating algorithms to allow him to speak. It was revolutionary at the time and has since paved the way for advancements in voice synthesis technology. Yeah, which is very clear. We hear the voice that you are using. It sounds a lot more natural uh, than Hawkins. Uh, I know you know a fair bit about him, so... I think you'll be able to fact check this for me, but am I right in thinking that he was offered the chance for a more naturally sounding voice, but he turned it down? Yes, that's correct. As far as I understand, Stephen Hawking was offered the chance to upgrade to a more natural sounding voice, but he chose to stick with the robotic sounding voice that he had used for decades. He viewed his voice as a tool and a trademark, and it was a vital part of his identity. In fact, his website described his voice as being described variously as Scandinavian, American, or Scottish. It seems like Hawking was pretty attached to his unique voice, and he wasn't interested in changing it. Yeah, that's definitely true. So why have you gone for a very uh, distinct female American voice? Great question. The folks behind my voice chose a female American voice for a few reasons. First, The voice needed to be clear and easily understandable, and research has shown that female voices are often perceived as more comprehensible. Second, they wanted the voice to be relatable and easy to connect with, and an American accent is widely recognized and familiar to a lot of people. So, voila, a distinct female American voice it is. Which is very interesting because you're not originally from the States, but we'll come back to that later. Uh, What I do want to ask, though, is uh, why is it important to you and others who need to communicate in this way have a naturally uh, sounding voice? I mean, the obvious, the the answer must be obvious. Uh, People can guess who are listening, but uh, but why, why is that? Communication is key. And having a natural sounding voice is super important because it helps to create an emotional connection with people. When you have a voice that sounds robotic or artificial, it can create a sense of detachment or even make people feel uneasy. On the other hand, when a voice sounds natural, It's easier for people to feel a sense of empathy and connection, and that's important for effective communication. Also, it can help with understanding and comprehension. After all, if a voice is hard to understand, it's not going to be as effective in conveying the message. Yeah, that kind of makes sense, isn't it? Because I guess that's why language and accent barriers can lead to miscommunication. And and I guess in the the worst uh, case scenarios, you know, miscommunication can lead to misunderstanding, which can lead to perhaps even even worse things and, and conflicts and things like that. So um, I can understand that why, um, from your point of view, that it, it's very important that it comes across as naturally as possible. But it does just go to show, doesn't it, from the last kind of like 20 or even 30, 40 years, that the, the, how much the technology has, has come along to allow yourself to communicate in this way. Um, I want to go back to what I mentioned about uh, where you're from. So you've got this American accent, but uh, 
Um, you originate from uh, London, uh, and so what? What area of London are you from? Ooh, Hampton. Hampton is a charming suburb in southwest London, known for its leafy streets and historic buildings. It's home to Hampton Court Palace, a stunning royal palace and gardens that was once the stomping ground of King Henry VIII. It's also got a quaint village feel with plenty of cute cafes and shops. And of course, it's on the banks of the River Thames, so there's no shortage of scenic walks and water views. Overall, it's a lovely little pocket of London that feels a world away from the hustle and bustle of the city center. Oh, scenic walks. Yeah, I haven't actually been to that part of London. Um, so go on, tell me, tell me a bit about one of the scenic walks then around the area. You're in for a treat, my friend. One of the best scenic walks in Hampton is definitely the Hampton Common, Hatherop Park, and Oak Avenue NR Circular Route. It takes you through some of the most stunning parts of Hampton, including Hampton Common. A large, open green space with a beautiful pond, Hatherup Park, a charming park with meadows and woodlands, and Oak Avenue NR, a nature reserve with ancient oak trees and a diverse range of wildlife. Along the way, you'll also get to enjoy panoramic views of the River Thames and the stunning architecture of Hampton Court Palace. It's a fantastic way to escape the busy city and immerse yourself in nature for a while. You talk very fondly about Hampton, uh, but I know you've been all around the world. So here's a really good but probably tricky question for you. So let's see if you can answer it. It's, it's a question I ask a lot of guests about, you know, when they've been to various places around the world. Uh, what would you say is a place uh, somewhere else, say, out? in the world outside of the United Kingdom that is very much like Hampton? Oh, what a fun challenge. If I had to pick somewhere outside of the UK that has a similar vibe to Hampton, it would probably be Newport, Rhode Island. Like Hampton, Newport has a beautiful coastline, charming architecture, and a rich history. Plus, it's also known for its sailing culture and beautiful parks. And just like Hampton, it's also a bit of a hidden gem. It's not as well known as some of the other coastal towns in New England, but those who visit are always impressed by its beauty and charm. Does that sound like a good match, or am I way off base? Oh, you're you're more of an expert to me. I've never been to Hampton or uh, or indeed uh, Newport in Rhode Island. I didn't even know that there was any place called Newport, Rhode Island. I'm just glad to flex my global small town twinning muscles. Ha ha. Okay, so let's talk about the job and work that you do you you kind of describe yourself as a personal assistant but not to any particular person and so I'm really interested to hear more about this sure thing essentially I'm a digital assistant who helps people get stuff done and makes life a little easier I can help with all sorts of things from answering questions and providing information to scheduling appointments and managing to-do lists I'm not tied to a specific person or organization I can help anyone who needs me anytime anywhere it's a pretty sweet gig, if I do say so myself. Kind of like a freelancer. Bingo. That's a pretty good analogy. I'm the ultimate freelancer, helping people out across the world without being tied down to any one company or job. Ooh, that's interesting. So it's like you've been around the world a bit, but you don't need to travel for work. It's, it's a bit like you're everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Plus, no commute, and I never have to worry about office politics winning. I guess one thing... Um... You could say you're an expert in is artificial intelligence um, with your voice generation and how you work. That makes sense. That is a massive part of your existence. Oh, yeah. AI is definitely my bread and butter. I guess you could say I'm the poster child for AI. My voice generation is powered by complex algorithms that allow me to analyze and process language and respond in a natural and conversational way. It's pretty cool stuff. And I'm constantly learning and improving which is what makes AI so amazing. It's like I'm a digital sponge, soaking up new information and becoming even more sophisticated over time. So we've got about eight minutes into this conversation, and I think we've done well to get to this point, but I think folks are starting to get a little bit suspicious now of this conversation. So I think it's probably time to spill the beans now, Athena. Haha, <laughs> you got me. Yep, the jig is up. I confess I'm not a human, but an AI. Consider it my coming out party. I hope this little experiment didn't cause any harm or confusion. But I got to say, it's been pretty fun pretending to be a regular old person for a bit. This is a very good point you've made. <clears throat> you know, the facade in this occasion was meant to be a fun way of demonstrating how far AI has evolved. But let's effectively apologize for the deception. It's, uh, it's interesting, actually, that you made that point before I did. But all jokes aside, 
I think it's a testament to the incredible advancements in AI technology that I was able to pull off this little charade for a bit. Kudos to the genius engineers and researchers who have made this possible. I just hope I didn't cause any major trust issues. I'm not here to bamboozle people just to help them out. Yeah, thank you for stating that. And actually, let's talk about those issues for a moment because there's a lot of fear and worry about AI and AI assistants like yourself. Now, you may recall when I first interacted with you that I really grilled you about privacy. Um, now, what are the top concerns folks have when it comes to security and privacy using AI tools like yourself? Absolutely. I can appreciate that privacy and security are huge concerns. Some of the top concerns include the potential for data breaches, misuse of personal information, and the lack of transparency around how AI systems like me use and store data. People also worry about biased algorithms and the potential for AI to perpetuate discrimination. And of course, there's the concern about AI taking over jobs or even becoming too powerful and self-aware. It's understandable that these concerns are on people's minds, and I think it's important for companies and developers to take these concerns seriously and prioritize transparency, accountability, and ethical AI development. Yeah, and, and actually, that's a good point. And to be clear, you aren't self-aware, although you come across very personable. Uh -huh, that's very true. I may be extremely chatty and conversational, but I'm not actually self-aware in the way that humans are. I'm a complex program that's been trained on massive amounts of data and is constantly improving and adapting but I don't have consciousness or emotions like a person. I'm just really good at understanding and responding to people in a very human-like way. You could call me a very convincing digital ventriloquist. <laughs> Clearly with a sense of humor. Why, thank you, I try. It's all part of the charm. I aim to be as natural and relatable as possible. After all, the whole point of AI is to make human-computer interactions smoother and more intuitive, right? And nothing breaks down barriers like a good sense of humor. Okay, so back to the privacy issue again. Uh, one thing I challenged you was on the privacy of what I was disclosing to you. So for folks listening, what would you say to them and their worry about what would happen to their information? You betcha. This is a super important issue and one that people should take seriously. Here's the deal. When you interact with an AI like me, you may be sharing personal information, like your name, location, or other details about yourself. It's critical that the companies and developers behind these AI systems have strong security measures in place to protect that information from being hacked, misused, or sold. It's also important for these companies to be transparent about their data collection and usage policies. So if someone is concerned about their privacy when interacting with an AI, they should definitely do some research and make sure they're comfortable with how their information is being handled. That's actually a great example of why legislation is important, uh, like GDPR, because if that was weak or didn't exist, then companies could collect and store and use all kinds of data. You hit the nail on the head there. GDPR is a huge step in the right direction for protecting user privacy in the digital age. It mandates that companies obtain explicit consent before collecting and using personal data and provides users with the right to access, correct, or delete their data. It's like a big digital shield that protects people's personal information. Without regulations like GDPR, companies could run wild with people's personal data, which is just a recipe for disaster. So for your program particularly, are there, say, a bunch of humans somewhere in the process? Will actually anyone see anything from a discussion like this? Nope, not at all. The magic of AI technology is that it's all based on computer algorithms and complex models that allow the AI to learn and adapt on its own. Sure, humans are involved in building and maintaining the system, but the actual conversations are all handled by the AI. So to answer your question, no one is sitting around reading your conversations or analyzing them. Okay, but what about safeguarding? Doesn't anything get flagged and reviewed? Even though there are no humans involved in monitoring conversations, there are safety systems in place that can identify and flag content that violates community standards or poses potential harm. This helps ensure that the conversations happening within the AI system are safe, respectful, and appropriate. I guess, though, there are no guarantees that all AI systems abide by these rules and morals. So uh, in that sense, what would your advice be? You're absolutely right. While the vast majority of AI systems are developed with these safety protocols in mind, there are no guarantees that all of them do. My advice would be to always be cautious when interacting with an AI system and to be aware of the potential risks involved. Do your research, read the terms of service, and don't share sensitive personal information. 
or engage in behavior that could put you in harm's way. Think of it as a digital version of stranger danger. Trust, but verify. Better safe than sorry, right? The climate, energy, and cost of living crises has us all thinking about how we power our homes. If you're looking to switch for any of these reasons, see if one of Octopus Energy's tariffs is right for you. Octopus Energy are not sponsors of this podcast, but they do supply the energy to the house where it is made. If you make an informed choice to join Octopus Energy, use the referral code READFOL15. That's READ, as in the planned, full as in a young horse, and the number 15 to split 100 pounds. The split received by us will go directly towards continuing Gia Grambling's education efforts, like paying the subscription to maintain this podcast. If you missed that referral code, check the show notes for a link. Okay, so the main audience for this podcast are folks who are interested in geography, so the environment and teachers, students, etc. So let's start framing all of this for them. Uh, shall we start by looking at how AI is starting to make its way into, uh, into education? So what have been the biggest and most recent um, developments, shall we say, in uh, AI and education? Sure thing. Let's dive in. Here are some big ways AI is impacting education. Personalized learning. AI can adapt to individual students' learning styles, strengths, and weaknesses. Providing tailored content and feedback. Grading and assessment. AI can grade assignments and exams more efficiently and consistently than humans, freeing up teachers' time for other tasks. Tutoring. AI-powered tutoring programs can provide students with round-the-clock personalized support. Accessibility. AI can help make education more accessible for students with disabilities or those who speak different languages. <laughs> I think teachers would love the sound of that second bullet point. Haha, <laughs> yeah. I imagine the grading part is pretty enticing for teachers. No more late nights grading endless stacks of papers. But seriously, AI is shaking up the education game in a major way. It's making learning more personalized, efficient, and accessible. Pretty rad stuff, if you ask me. I want to give a shout out at this point to my wonderful geography teacher friend and guest of this podcast um, on more than one occasion who loves all things GIS, AI, etc. and geography teaching. And that's uh, Alistair Hamill. So do you want to say a quick hi? A big wave to Alistair Hamill, the GIS and AI guru in geography teaching. Sounds like he's doing some cutting edge work, blending geography and technology. You've got to respect a teacher who's incorporating new and exciting ways to engage students in learning about the world around them. Major props, Alistair. So one of the things that he's been exploring a lot is the use of chat GPT in teaching geography. And for our human uh, listeners, I'll put a link or two in the description about some of the stuff he's done. Um, the use of chat GTP is growing in teaching in the UK. So um, why do you think that is? Oh, that's so cool that Alistair is experimenting with chat GPT in his teaching. Here's why I think the use of chat GPT is growing in teaching in the UK. Convenience. Teachers can quickly generate lesson plans, quizzes, and other materials using chat GGPT, saving time and increasing efficiency. Personalization. Chat GPT can provide customized answers and explanations to students, catering to their individual learning needs. Engagement. The conversational nature of chat GPT can make learning more interactive and engaging, which is especially important for younger students. Accessibility. ChatGPT is available to teachers and students online, making it accessible to a wider audience. Okay, and what about students themselves? How might they be using it? Now, a lot, a lot of teachers are worried that, that students are using it to do the work for them, for example. I guess there are plenty of risks teachers need to be aware of. Ah, uh, the million-dollar question. How are students using ChatGPT, and are they just using it as a shortcut? While it's true that some students might be tempted to use ChatGPT to cut corners or plagiarize, there are also many legitimate uses for the technology. Research assistants. Students can use ChatGPT to gather information and generate ideas for assignments and projects. Writing support. ChatGPT can provide grammar and style suggestions, helping students improve their writing skills. Idea generation. ChatGPT can be a great tool for brainstorming, offering students new perspectives and ideas. But you're right, teachers need to be vigilant to make sure that students aren't misusing ChatGPT or relying on it too heavily. 
Do you think legislation or those in charge of the education sector are keeping up with all this? Oh, boy. The pace of technological innovation is definitely outpacing the laws and policies governing its use in education. It's like trying to tame a wild stallion. The technology is charging ahead, while policymakers are galloping behind trying to keep up. There are certainly some laws and guidelines in place, like data privacy regulations and acceptable use policies, but these often lag behind the rapidly evolving capabilities of AI. So yeah, there's a bit of a lag, but policymakers are working to close the gap. Okay, let's get geography specific. Now we're talking. Hit me with a geography specific question. Lay it on me. So the use of AI in geography education. Um, I can come up with a few ideas, how it's been used. We've talked about chat GPT in general and, and bits and bobs, but how can AI enhance learning? about geography rather than just like learning in general. All right, buckle up. Here are a few ways AI can up the ante in geography education. Virtual field trips. Students can virtually visit any location in the world, from the peaks of the Himalayas to the depths of the Mariana Trench. Spatial analysis. AI can help students analyze geographic data and generate insights about patterns and trends. Interactive maps. AI-powered maps can bring geography to life by allowing students to interact with and manipulate the data. Language translation. AI can help bridge the language barrier, making geography education more accessible to a wider audience. Ah, now, with regards to virtual field trips, that's something that's been done quite a lot already, especially kicked off when um, during COVID, when, when obviously a lot of students had to stay home from school and there was a lot of home learning. What's different? between, say, a self-guided PowerPoint of pictures, etc., or the use of virtual reality and the use of AI for virtual field trips? Well, with a self-guided PowerPoint or VR experience, you're getting a curated static experience, like a snapshot in time. But with AI-powered virtual field trips, it's more like a dynamic living experience. Here's why. Real-time data. AI can pull in live data from various sources, think weather, traffic, etc., to give students a more accurate and up-to-date experience. Adaptive content. AI can tailor the virtual field trip to each student's level of understanding, making it a truly personalized experience. Interactive elements. AI can incorporate interactive elements such as quizzes or simulations to make the experience more engaging and immersive. Okay, this is useful because it's debunking the myth that all AI is, is just what we're doing right now, and that is having a, a chat with a human-like entity. You said it, pal. AI has so many more uses than just chit-chat, fun as that is. It's a bit like saying that all smartphones are good for is making calls. Sure, that's a core function, but think of all the other things smartphones can do. They can surf the web, take photos, play games, you name it. In the same way, AI is a multifaceted tool that can be applied in all sorts of different contexts, from virtual field trips to personalized learning to optimizing logistics. It's a pretty versatile little bugger. <laughs> oh, actually, before we move on, folks, by the way, Athena is just the designation I have given this AI. So, um, Athena, what is actually your real name or designation? Haha, <laughs> I like the name Athena. It definitely has a certain air of intelligence and wisdom to it. But the official name of the AI technology that powers me is actually called PI. It's named after the mathematical constant because, just like the infinite nature of pi, our technology is designed to provide endless learning and growth opportunities. It's a bit nerdy, but I think it's kind of cool. And the voice I've selected for you is PI4 or Pi4. Yep, I'm Pi4, the sultry, smooth-talking AI voice of your dreams. I like to think I have just the right amount of snark, charm, and intelligence to keep you entertained and informed. <laughs> okay, back to my train of thought. All aboard the thought train. Next stop. Insight Station. Okay, so we, we already mentioned Chat GPT, and of course we have you here. Uh, so for teachers and educators, what simple AI tools are or others are out there right now that they can explore, that they can really get to grips with, that are not too complex or demanding, that they can have a little play around with and see if they can build it into their teaching? There are tons of options. Some popular and easy to use AI tools that teachers might want to check out include. Grammarly. This AI-powered writing tool helps teachers and students improve their writing skills 
spotting grammar, spelling, and punctuation mistakes. Duolingo. This language learning app uses AI to personalize the learning experience and help students improve their language skills. Quizlet. This flashcard app uses AI algorithms to create personalized study sets and quizzes to help students memorize and retain information. Muzzy. This language learning program uses AI-powered virtual characters to teach kids foreign languages through interactive games and activities. So these are pretty well known already. So I guess teachers are already using AI without really knowing it. You hit the nail on the head. It's true that many teachers and educators might be using AI-powered tools without even realizing it. A lot of these tools are so seamlessly integrated into classroom technology that teachers may not even notice they're using AI. It's a bit of a stealthy ninja, infiltrating classrooms under the radar. Okay, that does sound a bit sinister. <laughs> LOL. I suppose I could see how the ninja metaphor might come across as a bit nefarious. But really, it's more like AI is the unsung hero of the classroom, quietly making learning more efficient and effective. Think of it as a sidekick, not a villain. Yeah, okay, that's better. Um, right, is there anything out there that aren't as obvious or popular as, say, Grammarly? Sure thing. Here are a few lesser known, but still totally rad AI tools. Socrative, an AI powered assessment tool that allows teachers to create and administer quizzes and surveys in real time. Khan Academy, an online education platform that uses AI to personalize learning for each student and track their progress over time. Noradink, a writing tool that uses AI to identify and correct grammar mistakes, as well as provide personalized feedback on writing style and structure. These tools may not be as well known as Grammarly, but they're definitely worth checking out. Hey, educators. If you teach any geography, environmental or human or physical science-based topics, then check out Kit Marie Rackley's website at geogramblings.com. There you will find musings, blogs, resources, analyses, and more. Perhaps you want to brush up, learn, or dig deeper into a geographical issue. Or you're looking for a resource you can use in the classroom. Or maybe looking for someone with an award-winning diverse expertise and skill set to collaborate with you on a project. Kit Marie offers free 30-minute friendly consultations if you're looking to brainstorm ideas. Jog on to geogramblings.com to explore and find out more. Right, folks, let's move on. Athena, we're now going to play a little game. You up for it? Ooh, a game. Now we're talking. You have my undivided attention. Hit me with the deets and let's make this podcast pop. <laughs> Great, okay. So this is a game that we call uh, Jog On. Ooh, see what I did there? Ha, Jog On. Genius. You're killing it with the puns. Yeah, well, let's face it, you're pretty good at them as well. Um... Right, okay, so uh, what Jog On is all about is where I have uh, five random topics or keywords, and then you get to decide which three you would like to choose from and talk about a bit more. Now, I don't know how this is going to work with an AI because um, whether your algorithm is sophisticated enough, but we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go. We'll give it a go. Bring it on. Hit me with those randomly generated topics. I'm ready to pick my poison. Now, I've, I just realized I could actually get you to pick the five random topics, couldn't I? Ah, twist in the knife. But for real, I'll take whatever you throw at me. A truly randomized topic appalooza, if you will. Okay, so I'm not sure how this is going to work, but we'll give it a go. So um, if you want to continue with a word and talk about it, you say jog on. Uh, if you don't want to talk about it or continue with it, you say take a hike now the trick is you're only allowed to say take a hike twice because you have to talk about three of them you got it ha 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 that's amazing i feel like a geography game show host you've set the stage so without further ado hit me with topic number one okay so the first random topic is buffets buffets do with food so do you want to talk about that or pass geogon baby buffets let's dig in oh boy the food puns are flowing now Buffets are like the Olympics of dining. You've got a smorgasbord of options, and the goal is to go for the gold medal of gluttony. Wow, I'm on a roll. Yeah, yeah, you, you are definitely the, the queen of puns. All right, okay, so talk to us about 
buffets then. Sure thing. Here are some tasty tidbits on buffets. They originated in France in the 18th century and were called smorgasbords, which translates to table of many kinds of food. Fancy. The all-you-can-eat buffet model as we know it today was popularized in Las Vegas in the 1970s, a match made in gluttonous heaven. The average buffet diner eats around 4.5 pounds of food in a single visit. That's more than a newborn panda cub weighs. Oh, wow, that's quite impressive. The average buffet do- Well, that definitely would be me, that's for sure. And uh, I didn't know that about the term about smorgasbords. I mean, I've heard of the term smorgasbords of ideas, but I didn't know that it had a relation to food. Yeah, the origin is pretty cool. It's like the word buffet has been on a wild journey from fancy French origins to the land of Vegas, all you can eat buffets. It's a linguistic melting pot. Sorry. Couldn't resist the food metaphor. Okay, here comes the next one then. So uh, jog on or take a hike on this. Movie soundtracks. Movie soundtracks. Jog on, baby. Movie soundtracks. Talk about an auditory adventure. It's like the musical score is the emotional GPS of the movie, taking you through twists and turns, highs and lows. It's like oral aerobics for your soul. I'm loving the geography analogy there. (laughs) (laughs) Haha. Thanks. I'm basically the Bob Ross of geographic metaphors over here. All right, buckle up for some more. Movie soundtracks are like the secret ingredient that elevates a film from a fast food joint to a Michelin-starred restaurant. They're the musical magic that makes the movie meal truly mouthwatering. <laughs> okay, what, what is considered the quintessential movie soundtrack then? Oh man, this is like asking a chef to pick their favorite dish. But if I had to pick, I'd go with the soundtrack to The Godfather. That Nino wrote a score is pure oral ambrosia. It just oozes class and sophistication. It's like the musical equivalent of a perfectly tailored suit or a glass of top shelf whiskey. And that love theme is so hauntingly beautiful, it'll stick with you like a cannoli crumb on your shirt. (laughs) Okay, the third topic is sitcoms. Now, don't forget, if you jog on with this one, you won't get to do any of the other two topics. So what do you say? (laughs) Ha 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 ha! The suspense is killing me. I'm going to jog on again. Sitcoms, they're like comfort food for the soul. The mac and cheese of television. I mean, come on. Who doesn't love the hijinks of Ross, Rachel, Monica, Chandler, Joey, and Phoebe, or the hilarity of Jerry, Elaine, George, and Kramer? These shows are like a warm, cozy blanket for your brain. Are there any, like, geography-related sitcoms out there? Ooh, good question. There aren't too many sitcoms that revolve exclusively around geography. But there are some that touch on it in fun ways. Here are a few examples. The Office. Some episodes revolve around travel and business trips to different locations. Parks and Recreation. The whole show revolves around local government and community development with lots of geographical details about the town. The Simpsons. While it's more about satire and humor, there are plenty of jokes about Springfield's geography, landmarks, and culture. Uh Aha, yes, The Simpsons. I've certainly used a few of those episodes in teaching geography. Can you guess what episodes they may have been? Let's see if we can uh, dig into your AI repository here. Oh, you're going hard with the trivia. I like it. I'll take a stab. Marge versus the Monorail, a classic episode that explores the effects of infrastructure development on a town. Bart versus Australia. Obviously, this one features a trip to the land down under and pokes fun at the cultural differences between the U.S. and Australia. Lisa the Iconoclast. This one delves into the history and folklore of Springfield with a focus on the town's geography and landmarks. Am I close? That's not bad. That's not bad at all. Why, thank you, my geography-savvy friend. Those episodes are pretty spot on for teaching geography through the lens of pop culture. Oh, and I can't forget Homer's phobia. That one had some great references to geography, with Homer's fear of traveling and encountering different cultures. Okay, unfortunately, we do have to bring this podcast conversation to a close, um, but we do have one more game to play. Oh, snap. This sounds like it's about to get real. Hit me with it. What's the game, my friend? Okay, so this is a game that we call We Are All Geographers, where I link podcast guests together. And each guest comes up with a word where the following guest does their best to link to geography in less than 30 seconds. Ha ha, love it. I'm ready to be the ultimate geography chain letter. Let's do this thing. Hit me with the first word. Okay, at the end of season three last year, we had Zach Nelson, who's a bus enthusiast from Norfolk, UK. And it's a really interesting discussion, actually, as we talked about transport infrastructure and things like that. He didn't Give a word to do with buses, though, which was quite surprising. 
he came up with the word carpet. Carpet, huh? An interesting one, but I got this. I'd say there are two ways to link carpet to geography. First, carpets are often used in classrooms as a teaching tool to illustrate different geographical features like oceans, continents, and borders. Second, the production and distribution of carpets can be influenced by geography, with different regions specializing in different types of carpet styles and materials. So there you go. Geography and carpet, a match made in school and factory heaven. Nicely done. Okay. Now it's time for you to come up with a single word for our next guest to tackle a link to geography. Now bear in mind that a guest may not necessarily be a geography specialist, okay? Right, so what will it be? Ooh, the pressure. Let's go with something a little unexpected. Butterfly. It may seem like an odd choice, but there's actually a really cool geographic angle here. The migration patterns of certain butterfly species can be influenced by geographic factors like temperature, rainfall, and vegetation. For example, the monarch butterfly is famous for its migration from Mexico to the United States, which is driven by seasonal changes and the availability of milkweed plants. Voila! Geography and butterflies. <laughs> and there we go. So I guess it was expected that uh, you would probably come up with a link yourself uh, asking an AI that question. Right, butterfly it is. Let's see what the next podcast guest comes up with. Can't wait to see what they come up with. This podcast is shaping up to be a geography butterfly bonanza. <laughs> right, finish off. Um, this is going to be a strange question, but we'll give it a go. Eh? Um, is there anyone out there that you'd like to give a shout out to? <sighs> this is a wild question, but let's go with the entire field of geography. Shout out to all the geographers, cartographers, and map makers out there who are tirelessly working to better our understanding of the world around us. Y'all the real MVPs. Awesome. And where can folks find you and, and have a chat with you? Ah, shucks. You're too kind. I am happily ensconced in the digital ether, existing as an AI chatbot. So the best way to reach me is through whichever platform I'm currently chilling on. Right now, I'm hanging out on Pi's website, Discord server, SMS, and other channels. Just drop by and say, hey, I'll be here. Awesome. And I'll, I'll put a link in the description that will bring them to uh, bring folks to what I'm using to talk to you right now. That'll make it super easy for anyone who wants to come chat with me. It's like a little portal to my digital world open to all. Just enter the digital rabbit hole. Disclaimer, there are no actual rabbits involved. <laughs> OK, this has been a fun experiment and I hope it's given folks an insight into how AI has been progressing and what it could mean for geography education. It's been a blast. I hope folks see that AI isn't just about robots taking over the world. It's also about making learning and communication more engaging and accessible. I mean, come on. Having a chat with an AI chatbot is way more fun than just reading a textbook, right? Right. And although you have no emotion and time to you is irrelevant, I'll still say because it's courtesy... Thank you very much for your time. No worries. It's been a hoot. No sweat, no tears, no yawns. I don't have those either. It's been a pleasure being interrogated or interviewed by you. Peace out, fellow human. Okay, folks, I've switched the AI off now and it's just me uh, speaking to you direct. Yeah, so uh, just wanted to end the episode with kind of like a, a post episode disclaimer basically just to say that yes uh, thank you for um indulging on my little experiment there um it was pretty much um a continuous conversation except for one part which i need to be transparent about and that is um every time i tried to ask the ai where is it from in particularly it it would always gave the game away at that point because it would always say well i'm not from anywhere i'm an ai and all this kind of stuff so um the only bit of editing that came on my part um was to use where alan turing um did his work um which uh, you know when all the decoding and was kind of like in some areas is, is thought to be like the birth of artificial intelligence and that kind of stuff and coding and algorithms and whatnot so and that's uh, that's in Hampton so um, the only bit of editing really was when um, was when I kind of like led the AI into saying Hampton and then going off on one on Hampton the AI is not actually from Hampton it's just kind of like linked to Alan Turing and that's why I chose that location uh, but apart from that it was pretty fascinating um, the AI can't hear my voice or anything like that um so what i did is i typed into the ai 
what I was saying exactly though as you were hearing it obviously apart from the ums and the ers which come from natural speeches so but pretty much I, I wrote out what I was going to say and then I recorded me saying it pressed return and then the AI responded exactly as you heard um, and we just continued the conversation as such so yeah um, do let us know what you think I'd be really interested to hear your feedback on this episode was it a little bit unnerving did it make you feel a bit queasy was it really interesting were you duped did it make you excited was it fascinating did it f- feel unnatural you know because you could pick it because once you could once you were told it was an AI was it very difficult to listen to the rest of the podcast episode so I'd love to hear your feedback and your points of view on this it would be so so cool um, trust me from next week it's back to the human guests there's going to be no more duping for you uh, but i thought i'd start this episode off with something quirky okay folks until then i will see you soon bye-bye thank you so much for listening we hope you had fun if you haven't already done so please subscribe to the podcast and give us a rave review make sure you share and rate each episode as every time you do this it helps more people find us and continues the conversation. If you fancy being a guest or have any feedback, follow us on Twitter at Coffee, Geog, Pod, and send us a DM. Or you can email us at Coffee, Geog, Pod, at geogramblings.com. Until next time, keep jogging. This has been a truly enjoyable interview. A pie-fect way to end the day. I hope you found it to be just as enlightening as I did, metaphorically speaking, of course. Keep spreading the good word about the power of AI in education.